Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video we'll be taking a look at one of the cheapest AM4 motherboards on the market right now, and one which actually covers a lot of bases. This is Gigabyte's A520M DS3H. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video, we go through, do an unboxing, see what we actually get, go through a tour of all the features, all of the connectivity, all that kind of stuff. And also we'll be discussing some of the important issues regarding the compatibility. So I'll get it straight out of the gate right now, so you don't have to watch the whole video if you don't want to. If you're planning to buy this and use it with a Ryzen 5 3400G and nothing else, no extra graphics card, just that, it isn't gonna work, pure and simple. This is one of the few processors, the 3200G and the 3400G are both processors which basically will not work with this as intended. Now they will work fine if you use them with a discrete GPU or a separate graphics card, just using the CPU for CPU tasks and a separate GPU for visuals, all that kind of stuff, absolutely fine. But if you wanna use the 3200G or the 3400G as a standalone processor on this board, it won't, it does not work. It'll work for things like Google and various benchmark programs, etc., etc. As soon as you try and run a game, within a few seconds, you'll get the black screen of death and the system will freeze. So that is a, a very, very stern warning to those of you planning to get this, maybe with the 3400G build. It does say on the box that it isn't compatible with the 3200G and the 3400G. And often in some cases, other motherboards have had some success in running that configuration. But this specific board, from every BIOS, from BIOS F2 all the way up to the current one, which I think was 13P or 13F or something, it doesn't work at all. And I've tried it on every single BIOS revision. So let that be a warning to you. But with that said, let's get on and do the unboxing. So first of all, what is the A520 MDS3H? Now essentially it is an upgraded version of the A520M-K, which we've reviewed previously, which you can check out up here. There are some very kind of subtle differences between the two boards, uh, one of which is this has a slightly better VRM setup, so this has got eight phases split into five plus three. Also, you do have four memory slots. So depending on what your use case scenario is, you may find this beneficial over the M-K. Obviously, you can buy two lots of RAM now, get dual channel up and running, then maybe a little bit later down the line when you've got a little bit more money, then you can add another two sticks of RAM. If you're actually planning to use this in some kind of application where memory frequency is everything, then you might actually be better off going with the M-K with its two memory slots, which will actually clock higher frequencies on the RAM due to less tracks, all that kind of stuff, better connectivity. That is essentially how it works. If you want to overclock your RAM to the highest possible configuration, then two slots are going to be better than four. Other than that, there's some very subtle differences between the two boards, which we'll take a look at when we go through the unboxing. So first of all, packaging wise, again, as we expect, this is part of the ultra durable range. So you've got the, uh, the typical colors there. Ryzen 5000 series compatible. So if you want to use a 5000 series chip, you can do this. So 5600X all the way up to the Heady 5950, if you wanted to, it is listed in the compatibility charts, but realistically, this probably isn't the best board to pair with that. But certainly for lower end chips, I would say realistically up to kind of like an eight core, 16 thread chip, this is an ideal board and it will work straight out of the box and you shouldn't have any issues with thermal throttling due to the VRMs, etc. But if you're looking at going slightly higher or maybe you wanna do some overclocking, then this probably isn't the board for you. As I said earlier, it's got on there the third gen Ryzen ready. Depending on which version of the board you get, obviously yours may have a 5000 series sticker ready label on it if it does. It means that 5000 series chips will work out of the box. If it's got the 3000 series sticker, then it will need a BOSS update to use those newer 5000 series. Again, depending whereabouts you buy this, when you get it, etc., just look at the label. That will tell you the compatibility. Unfortunately, there is no way other than physically getting the box and finding what board is in there. Obviously, if the board matches the box, that is the only real way of working out which BOSS is actually on the board, or at least what it should be on there. Of course, if you want to, this does have USB flashback, so you can use that to update your BOSS very easily, so you won't need one of those older chips to actually update the BOSS. And if you wanna find out how to do that, we've done a couple of videos from QFlash, which uh, you can find up here. Moving right on to the back of the box, so we've got the five plus three digital PWM design for the VRM. Also, you've got the Gigabyte enhanced 8118 gigabit ethernet with the uh, bandwidth management, should you wish to. There is an app available from the Gigabyte store, which you can download to control all of that. You've also got the uh, PCI Express Gen 3 times two M.2 connector, 
You've got Smart Fan 5 built in, and also we've got RGB 2.0. This supports both 12 volt RGB and also 5 volt digital addressable ARGB, which is absolutely brilliant. Also on the bottom, it goes on to talk about the high quality caps, the BIOS flashback mechanism, so you can update it via USB, as we discussed a little bit earlier. Yep, solid caps. Essentially, it's a pretty decent board for what the actual price of it is. Now, this at the moment in the UK, we can pick these up for around about £30. So I think I picked this one up for like £27, which is pretty insane if you think about it. So if you're considering a budget build these days and you're looking around at boards and processors and seeing where the best value is, some of the Intel processors do offer extremely good value. But then when you go to look at a motherboard, so if you're looking at a B460 or a 560 board, those are generally quite expensive still in the 70, 80 pounds mark. Whereas on the AM4 platform, we do have this A520 chipset, which really does cut some costs and you can get some tremendous bargains. Of course, there are some really good bargains available for the B450 boards as well, which we've certainly reviewed a ton of, which you can check out up here. Those also do offer a, a pretty good alternative depending on what your needs are. But for me, less than 30 pounds for this board, I was really excited to give it a go and I was desperate to get it to work with my 3400G, which, yeah, it basically doesn't necessarily put a graphics card in, which kind of makes the whole thing pointless. But anyway, that's my problem, not yours. So let's take a look and see what we actually get in the box, and I'll be completely honest with you, for less than £30, don't be surprised, you don't get a great deal in the box. What we do get are two SATA cables, one with a 90 degree connector and the other one with straight connectors. The board itself, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. You get a very atypical I.O. shield on the back, which actually does have the labels on there as well, so it tells you what each actual connector is, which, uh, yeah, not brilliant, but it's a nice touch. You get a multilingual installation guide, a driver DVD, and a very basic user manual. The user manual itself doesn't actually need to be particularly advanced or very specific. There are quite limited features on here, but certainly this will be very helpful for you. So let's take a look at the board itself. And as you can see, this is a micro ATX board for those of you that haven't spotted it already. It's a pretty compact design. Again, very, very similar to the M-K, which we reviewed previously, links up here. This one is a little bit wider, obviously, because you've got the extra tracks for the RAM, etc. But other than that, yeah, it's pretty much a very similar design. So in the top corner, we've got our eight pin power connector or EPS connector. So you can on there, depending on the processor, you can use a four pin or an eight pin. Choice is entirely up to you. Around this section here, we've got our eight phase VRM, so that's split into two lots, so five and three. So five for the CPU and three for the uh, V core. It's a, a very difficult thing as well because the M K has a very different VRM setup, but it does have a better low side. So arguably, the low side VRM is possibly more important to the system than the high side, but again, we're going into the minutiae of it here essentially for a 30 pound board to have eight true phases is pretty awesome. So moving across, we've got our CPU socket. So this is AM4, which works with pretty much most AM4 processors, even 1000 series from yesteryear. They seem to work absolutely fine. Uh, 2200G works fine. The 3000G works fine. As we said, the 3200 and the 3400G, not so much fun. In this top section here, we've got our PWM connector for the CPU fan. There aren't a great deal of headers on this board to be completely honest with you, which is again, one of those cost cutting exercises, but there are three, so. Not brilliant, but certainly in most normal setups, so one header for the CPU, a front fan and a rear fan in most systems should be okay. Obviously, if you want to, you can use things like hubs and splitters, and we have done videos on those kinds of things. We'll link those below as well. So if you are considering this board and you want to add maybe three fans or six fans or whatever, we have done plenty of videos to help guide you through that. Moving across, we've got our four RAM slots, so you can have up to 64 gigs of RAM here if you wanted to. Whether or not you would on this kind of board, I, I don't know. That is down to the individual. Again, it's a budget board. I'm thinking most people realistically probably go and buy maybe two eights to start with, 16 gigs, and then maybe add another two at later dates to bring it up to 32. 16 to 32 do seem to be the kind of sweet spots these days. Windows is getting slightly more bloated these days and really likes to have eight gigs kind of to itself just to kind of get booted. So yeah, down to the individual. Obviously, if you want to, if you really are cheaping out on this and you want to get started as soon as possible, you could put in two fours and then maybe put in another two eights at a later date. I mean, choice is down to you. RAM speeds will be slightly limited on this board compared with the M-K. So this tops out around about 41.33. Again, depending on the processor and the quality of the RAM, your mileage will always vary on that. Essentially, a lot of it is going to be down to the actual processor itself. So if you're using a 2000 series processor, 
your memory speed is going to be slightly lower than on the 3000 and the 5000 series is going to do even better again so yeah your mileage will vary moving across we've got the 24 pin power connector in the usual place no diagnostic debug leds on this board at all again part of that cost cutting exercise to bring this down to a certain price point it is a very simplistic board Moving down, we've got the four SATA ports there, and next to that, we've got our BIOS flashback button. So there's a little button there, which essentially they've moved, most boards actually have it on the back on the IO. They've moved it for some reason down to here, and the BIOS chip is pretty much next to it as well, so that's all in one place. Very easy to do, actually, the uh, Q flash with the USB. Again, we've done videos on that, and they'll be linked also. Next up, we've got a system fan header, so that's PWM. Again, all of these are controlled by Smart Fan 5, so you can do things like choose different areas of temperature sensing and you can use DC, PWM, pumps, all those kinds of things. Tiny little heat sink here on the actual system chip over the A520 chipset. It doesn't generate a great deal of heat, so in some cases you could probably have that with no heat sink at all. So yeah, that is reasonably useful. Moving along at the bottom, we've got our system panel IO connectors there and also the CMOS reset switch. Next to that, we've got a USB 3.0 header for your internal ports. And next to that, moving along, we've got a USB 2.0 port. It's only one of those, so you can run an additional two ports or maybe plug in one of those devices like the Corsair IQ, that kind of thing. Then moving along, we've got some slightly more less used ports, although one of them might be used a little bit more than others now. So we've got the COM port there, and next to that, we've got our TPM port. So that supports TPM 2.0. So yeah, if you're planning to run Windows 11 as things stand at the moment, yes, it does support TPM 2.0. And also, obviously, will support the virtual TPM built into AMD processors also. So you can use either, if your chip supports it, great. If you want a separate module, you can plug that in also. Moving along slightly more, we've got our RGB ports there. So we've got two RGB ports. One is the 5-volt addressable RGB. And also, we've got our 12-volt 4-pin RGB. So old-fashioned RGB and modern RGB, whichever you want to look at. Moving further across, we've got the HD audio connector. So this is using the Realtek chipset. So this is the LC. 892. Sometimes they do change out depending on which board you get. There's a revision one, which is the one we've got here. There's also going to be a revision two as well, which may have a slightly updated chipset, possibly the ALC897. Again, depending where you buy this, certain regions do seem to have different sound chips. So they essentially support the same thing. So you're looking at kind of 7.1 audio if you use the front panel headers. It's a generally reliable audio chipset. Absolutely fine, no issues with it. And they do use actually pretty decent Japanese caps. So let's take a look at our PCI Express ports now. So we've got three PCI Express ports here. So we've got two times one slots. So that's PCI Express Gen 3 times one. And also we've got our graphics card slots. So that's PCI Express Gen 3 times 16. You can, of course, if you want to, if you're using an APU, you can always put a PCI Express Gen 3 times four card in. So maybe you want to add another M.2 drive. And certainly you might want to. You have only got one M.2 slot here which supports both NVMe PCI Express drives and also will support the older SATA SSDs as well, should you wish to use those on there. That is possibly one of the, the larger limitations of this and also, again, a cost-cutting measure, as is the, uh, the theme on this particular board. So, yeah, depending on what you're doing, how many drives you want, again, you have got plenty of SATA ports there, although potentially you may lose a port or two if you start plugging things into your PCI Express Gen 3 ports which is the uh, the nature of the A520 and the B450 and the B550 chipsets. Unless you go for one of the really top chipsets, you are going to be kind of playing around with different PCI Express bandwidth issues on various ports and sockets. So moving slightly up from there, we've got our chassis fan header here. So this is probably going to be useful for a rear chassis fan. And that, I think, is pretty much it for the board. There isn't anything else on here. We've got no RGB. We don't even have heat sinks on the VRM. So... Yeah, it's pretty basic. Right, let's take a look at the rear I.O. So on the rear I.O., following the theme again, there isn't a great deal, but certainly enough to get you going. So you've got two USB 2.0 parts there and a PS2 port. So if you want to use an older keyboard and mouse, you can do. DVI-D, HDMI and display port. The HDMI and the display port will support up to 4K 60 Hertz. So if you get a relatively modern APU which supports that, you should be absolutely fine. Also, you've got the Gigabit LAN with activity LEDs. And then underneath that, you've got two USB 3.0 ports and another two there, one of which is color-coded white. So the white color-coded one is actually the one for flashing the BIOS. So when you're flashing the BIOS, when you're using the Q flash button, that is the port that you will need to use 
to put your USB stick in with that BIOS file on. In normal Windows use, it works as a normal USB 3.0 port, so no issues there whatsoever. You have got six ports in total on the back. Whether or not that's enough for systems these days, I'm not entirely sure. If this is gonna be in a workplace, I guess it's fine. Keyboard, mouse, printer, maybe a card reader, something like that. Maybe an additional USB stick or some kind of security device. That takes you up to about five, so yeah, you are cutting it fine, but I think six ports on PCs these days is pretty much okay. One thing you will possibly need to invest in, because this board, as you can possibly see already, doesn't have any Wi-Fi and doesn't have Bluetooth. So if you do want to have some sort of wireless connectivity, then again, that's either gonna be a PCI Express card, which may be slightly limiting, or you're gonna be tying up one of your USB ports. Now, depending on how you do it, if you configure your front USBs and plug in a, a dongle there, again, it's not really gonna make much difference. Choices down to you, but yeah, this board does not have any integrated wireless at all. Moving back to the audio, so yeah, again, pretty standard affair. So three ports, uh, line in, line and microphone. You can again configure it so the front panel connectors are part of your surround system, which I don't think anyone actually realistically uses, but potentially you might want to if you want to have a 7.1 or 5.1 surround setup. So that is pretty much it of a tour of the board. It's not a lot to get excited about. The only thing that I actually do get excited about is the cost of this. For less than £30, which I know I've said numerous times already, this does offer a ton of options for someone trying to get into PC gaming, PC building, or just to build a basic work PC for home. Now that a lot of us are now working from home more so, or kids are getting into games, etc., or you just want a separate machine to do something on, so business PC, works PC, gaming PC, whatever. This actually is a really, really cheap entry into AM4 platform. Getting 30 pounds, you can pick up a, a relatively inexpensive processor, somewhere around the sort of 100 pounds mark, some relatively cheap RAM, and essentially you're up and running. Power supplies are pretty cheap these days, cases you can get for almost next to nothing, or just even build it on a box, whatever. But this, as the platform for actually attaching everything, does offer a ton of cost savings, which is why these boards are so massively, massively popular in a lot of OEM builds. You do find these in a lot of OEM builds, this and the M-K, very, very popular indeed. And for good reason, they're pretty reliable boards. They've got a relatively decent feature set, and as long as you don't want to go crazy into overclocking, which again, if you haven't gathered this already, the A520 chipset doesn't officially support overclocking. You can use base clock overclocking, so you can kind of overclock the entire PCI Express or the chipset itself, but you can't do multiplier overclocking, so you can't just type in a new multiplier and you're off to the races. You do have to do some tweaks. You can obviously do things with the memory. You can overclock the memory, and you've got some pretty decent settings. We actually will be doing a BIOS tour of this board, so if you want to see the BIOS in more detail, then there'll be a link up in the video description there, or just click on the subscribe icon, and you'll be notified of the next video release. But yeah, this does really excite me. £30 is not a lot of money for actually a pretty foolproof board. You can use 5000 series process on there if you wanted to. Whether or not that's a good idea, I'll leave that down to the individual, but certainly OEMs are doing it, so why shouldn't you? So I think that's gonna be pretty much it. No frills on this board at all, just a functional, solid, reliable board for basically next to nothing. Let me know what you think about it in the comments section below. But in the meantime, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.